is everyone? Yeah. You well? Good. The most exciting thing when I get to these events is uh, the rug. I, um, <laughs> I, I, can't, I honestly can't tell you what it's like when you see your brand in a rug. It is a, it's, it's, it's a moving experience. And, and I just, you know, I, the first time I saw it, I was just it really, it was touching, moving, and inspiring. And even today, just seeing it again is, uh, is just wonderful. Um, so anyway, I'm going to enjoy it today. The, uh, do you remember the 90s when, uh, when speakers would come on stage and show you pictures of their Ferraris and their boats? And today, it's just the rug, right? It's, uh, <laughs> We've had a we've had a tough five years, so. So, <laughs> so uh, look, let's talk a bit about. Um, we're going to talk today about this methodology. We're going to bring together a number of entrepreneurs. We're going to um, have some people sharing best practices. Um, we're going to set up some accountability. Um, where you're going to meet people today who can hold you accountable to implementing things um, today. Uh, and really, we want to set you up for, for a different trajectory. You're on a path, and, and most people in this room are already on a very successful path. We deliberately target the marketing in such a way that we find people who are normally already six and seven figure businesses, sometimes even above that. Uh, and what, we're, what we find is that you're already on a very successful path. What we want to do is have an impact where we move that up a notch and move that up a gear over time and distance as well. So that's what we're here to do today. We've found that this methodology is um, very effective for businesses, small businesses, big businesses. Um, we've worked with companies that are just starting up with an idea. We've worked with six-figure service firms that want to break the time for money cycle. Uh, we've worked with seven-figure product businesses and manufacturing businesses. We've even gone right up to sort of eight, nine-figure businesses where you know, um, this methodology is being used to create standout people within an organization as well. So it's a very powerful methodology. Um, it stands rigor. It's something that has been around for a long time. You can think back over a long, long time. And, and we know that successful entrepreneurs are great at pitching. They publish content. Um, they have great products. They raise their profile, and they do partnerships. This is the acts of leadership. Um, there's a reason that we're talking about it now and why it's more relevant now than ever. And the reason is this shape. Um, this shape is a very annoying shape. It's um, it's actually a shape that shouldn't exist. Uh, what happened is, um, does anyone know what this shape is, by the way? Yeah, it's income distribution. Right? So income distribution basically means that this top percentage, the top 10%, earn exponentially more than the rest of the marketplace. So the top 10% tend to earn you know, something ridiculous like 90% uh, or 80% of the income in, in any given industry. So, you really have to be one of these key people of influence or else you know, it's kind of game over. It's a little bit tiresome. So what happened is that the internet came along uh, and what it was meant to do was get rid of this shape. What was meant to happen with the internet is that it would democratize things and it would make everything flat. Um, and it's actually the, the opposite has happened. What's happened is the internet has leveraged a small group of people at, at the center of an industry and made them exponentially more influential. So you take those, those few people on that inner 10% of your industry, and now they don't just reach their local community. They can have a national reach or an international reach. They can find clients and customers everywhere. Um, they can have influence everywhere. Um, I'm sure people in this room uh, follow bloggers and you know, videos from uh, people all over the world, and you have inf you know, they're having an influence on you across borders using things like YouTube and those sorts of things. Um, what it also did is it didn't just end there. The internet made it possible for 10,000 new competitors to come into your marketplace. Right? So it made it possible for not just the uh, people here to earn a lot, lot more money. It made it possible for thousands of more people to come piling in to this newbie area and this area here. So it's a really interesting time. We're going through a real, real shake-up time where we're trying to figure out how do we um, how do we adapt to this huge change? Um, if we look at it like this, I want you to think about it more like this, because it's an inner circle. It's the inner circle of the industry. Um, so if we actually kind of look at it from above, we'll notice that there's three layers. So here's how it works, right? Here's our, here's our rug. So on the outer layer of your industry are the newbies. And the newbies are the people who are really excited to be in the industry. They're brand new. They've just got their qualifications, maybe. Um, they're, they're just starting out. They're reading all the blogs. They've heard about how exciting this industry is. They've heard about how many wonderful things can happen. They've got a really high level of energy and enthusiasm, but a low level of functionality. <laughs> right? 
which is, which is wonderful. And they, they know that very short period of time they're going to conquer the world. What happens is not that, though. What happens is they move into this second zone. The second zone is the worker bees. And the worker bees are really the majority of the industry. That's where you basically find yourself commoditized. You're working in an industry. You find it hard to stand out. You do OK. You take home wages. Um, but really, all of those dreams that you had for being in your industry start to get a little bit squashed. And you start to realize it's a lot damn harder than you thought. So you might imagine a great example, someone who gets into, say, photography, and they imagine themselves being this world-famous photographer, traveling the world, doing great photography. You know, and then they end up in that commoditized space where you know, every day they're trying to just figure out how they're different from other photographers. And they've got all the functional skills. You know, they're very proficient. They're good at what they do. They've got all the technical ability and, and the resources available to them. But they're just feeling that they're stuck in that worker bee space. The third zone is where we want to get to. This is the key person of influence space. And the key person of influence is someone who doesn't just have the functional skills, but they've come, become something called vital. Vital means two things. Vital means full of a life force, so life force. Um, and it means irreplaceable. So if you imagine these people, they become the irreplaceable life force of an industry. They're the ones who you, you can't ignore. They're the ones who attract opportunity. They're the ones whose names come up in conversation. So that, that's the irreplaceable life force. They're in a vital space. This is very much a functional space. This is very much a vital space. It's hard to do business without these people. Here's what happens, though. We're, we're human. So we get caught in the uh, worker bee space out here. All of our dreams feel like they're being squashed. We go, oh, well, I can't be like that key person of influence who I've heard of. So I know what I'll do. I'll go and have a look at the, uh, the grass on the other side of the fence. We'll go having a look around here. So what happens is we have people who are in this worker bee space go off and find a new industry. And suddenly, guess what? They feel that excitement again. So it's wonderful getting into that new industry. You go from being an accountant, now you're a DJ. Yeah. <laughs> Here's what happens, though. Because this works the same in every industry, what happens is we go on the merry-go-round of distraction. We go from new idea, new seminar, new business opportunity, new industry, and we go around looking and looking and looking. And the problem is, is that this journey can take a couple of years where we go newbie, worker bee, newbie, worker bee, newbie, worker bee. And what happens is we often end up back at the industry that we've got uh, skills in. But because we've been away for two years, they treat us like we're newbies again. So we take those steps backwards. What's worse is that someone that we knew in that industry has now made it here, and it just irritates you. <laughs> Does this story sound familiar to anyone? <laughs> yeah. So we want to break that. We want to, there's, a, there's two people who are running around out there, and we want to be one of them and not the other. There's the opportunist and the entrepreneur. So the opportunist is really that person who's just jumping from opportunity to opportunity, looking for the easy opportunity. The entrepreneur is someone who's tuned into themselves. They're actually tuned into what it is they're up to in the world. They have a vision, a purpose, um, and they're, they're pushing through what we call the dip. They're pushing through. So when, when the time gets difficult, they change strategies and they push through the dip and they go north. Um, what we're going to talk about today is a, a little change in strategy. In this worker bee space, it's all about technical ability and functional ability. We want to go from functional skills and technical skills to what we call soft skills. And the soft skills we're going to talk about is, is the different skills, not focusing on getting another degree or another qualification, but focusing on some soft skills that set you apart and leverage the influence that you have. So we want to push through that dip. Now, we're in a really interesting time. We know that. Uh, Influence comes from being visible, remarkable, credible, and valuable, being a key person in the industry that you love. But if we were talking a couple of decades ago, it would be almost a little bit pointless, because for a long, long time through the Industrial Revolution, it really came down to what schools you went to, what families you were part of, being luck. High intelligence didn't have a lot to do with it. <laughs> What's wonderful is we're going through some radical changing times. We're going through a big change at the moment. So we're in changing times. We're in a revolutionary time. Who here feels that we're in a revolutionary time? You think, yeah. Who here's industry has been really shaken up in the last few years? Yeah. I know for me, it's huge. Stuff that, stuff that I, I started out my journey at 21, and I got into um, 
I got into a business in Australia. I was 21 years old. I, I tell you, right time, right place, right economy, right mentor. I was very, very lucky. And it was very successful from year one. It was basically uh, did $1.3 million in, in its first year, about three, 400 grand in profit. And it was very much just luck. Um, you know, you couldn't come into the marketplace in the last couple of years and do that sort of thing. Um, I was very lucky that I started when I, exactly the right time that I started. Um, and then it grew like crazy as well. We were making 10 million in sales three years later um, and, you know, built a very, very big national business in Australia and then grew, grew over here. Um, but all the stuff that worked 10 years ago doesn't work today. All the stuff that we did to build that business 10 years ago, you know, that, that, that stuff doesn't work. We have to radically shift. There's been a revolution uh, take place in, in the industries I've worked in. I've been part of several industries and seen, you know, the way that they work. So, huge shake-up. Now, this hasn't happened for a long time. The last time this happened was the agricultural age to the industrial age. Agricultural age was quite interesting that we basically we had these people ploughing fields and using horse and cart and they go around and they make their li livelihood from the land and they make things on the land and they sell it at the market. Happy days. Um, along comes a technological shift. So it was technology that did this. And the technological shift comes along and creates these things called factories. And the factories have fossil fuels and they have machinery and suddenly one machine can do the job of a hundred wonderful tailors. So you know they used to say fine tailoring and it was because the tailor could get the stitching perfectly, right? And they could do perfect stitching. And people used to admire fine tailoring because, tailoring because of the f fine stitch, stitch work. And then a you know, sewing machine comes along and just does it, you know, does it in a second. So, you know, we're talking about a, a huge shift. It put 40 to 50% of the population out of their jobs. It made the people who had jobs almost worthless. So there became two classes of people. There was the factory owner, um, who owns the factory and controls all the labour and, and, and set up a system called the division of labour. And then there were the victims of division of labour and those were the people who basically, um, the division of labour made each job insignificant and replaceable. So these people had absolutely no value whatsoever. Um, now this basically evolved into the economic system uh, that we've had for the last 150 years. I don't care if you've worked in a white collar factory or a blue collar factory, the system is designed to make you replaceable and to pay you just enough so you, you uh, do your job um, and, uh, and to keep it, you know, keep it quite small. Um, and the only power that originally had uh, these people had uh, was the power to form unions and to break, you know, hold, link arms, walk out of the factory, shut the whole factory down. Um, these people were so disempowered and so worthless because of division of labour that basically what happened is that Henry Ford was the only person who could come up with a single argument as to why we should pay these people a little bit of money so they can afford to live. Do you know what his argument was? He said, if we don't pay these people um, some money, there'll be no one to buy all this shit we're producing. <laughs> basically, he said, we've got to create a market, we've got to create a middle class. Um, so he didn't see any value in them. He saw the value in actually fueling the marketplace. And all the money had moved, like that spike, to a few industrialists. So what happens, what happens today is we've seen this shift. And the shift is, is kind of a subtle shift. You know, I talk about this factory. Factory owner making decisions and being strategic. Factory worker doing the work. Factory owner, factory worker. So what happened is about 15 years ago, we started inventing technology that allows people to kind of do both and it allows the factory to get smaller. You can, you know, you used to have to take 100 people to produce something, then you could produce it with 50, then 40, then 30, then... Tw and now, we have this thing, factory in your pocket, right? So what that means, when you've got a factory in your pocket, when you can do business in a Starbucks, what that means is that you've got one person who's straddling strategy and doing all the work of factory owner and also doing all the work, lots of work. So what do we call this new person? Burnt out. Burnt out. <laughs> <laughs> Exhausted, yeah, of course. <laughs> we call this person an entrepreneur. Right? The entrepreneur is this, this revolutionary new thing. I mean, this was not a word 15 years ago. You talk to people who have been an entrepreneur 15, 20 years, and they'll tell you that 15 years ago, if you told someone you're an entrepreneur, they'd sigh and say, oh, can't get a job. <laughs> Right? This was not something to be looked up to. This was like Del Boy was an entrepreneur, right? <laughs> so, so we basically, we got these people now who are doing both things. Now, it's different today. It used to be that highly skilled, highly talented people 
would go out and get a job at a big factory, Ernst & Young or Deloitte or Accenture or something like this, and they're highly skilled and they go work for these big white collar factories. Right? Today, highly skilled, highly talented people are not out getting big, great jobs now. They're leaving those jobs to work in small to medium sized businesses. Right? This is really wild. Every day I'm seeing people who are at director level of these big firms quitting the firm, going off and starting their own boutique firm. Right? Now that's weird. It's not really logical that a tiny little business sees more advantage in being small than being big. It's not logical that a highly talented person thinks they can make more money and have more fun out on their own than with the protection of a huge brand or a huge company. Right? And yet, that's what people are making. People are making that assessment every single day. So here's why. Someone came along and spent billions on you. You've got a rich uncle, a very rich uncle called Silicon Valley. Right? Uncle Google, as Dashana said. So someone came along and spent billions on your business and you didn't even ask for it or know about it. They spent billions on you. They are wearing the cost of this huge technology. Huge investment has gone into your business whether you, whether you chose it or not. You have a global broadcasting television network. And all you have to do is just upload something. You've got a, the ability to broadcast your blogs and your articles and your thoughts without anyone gr green lighting it. You've got the ability to find information, do research, without anyone charging you a cent for it. Um, you can send products whizzing around the world just for a fraction of the cost that it used to cost. You can have channels of distribution where you can sell products all over the world and all you have to do is upload the image of the product. You don't even have to have a warehouse or any of those sorts of things. Um, we, we have huge uh, investment and we get to run these businesses but not have to pay for this investment. Problem is, is so, so does everyone else. Everyone else has got that investment as well. So we have to be on the leading edge of that curve, doing things a lot smarter than most in order to make the most of the times that we're in. I warn you, if we have anything to go by with the agricultural revolution, it's not all roses from here. There's going to be two types of people. There's going to be people who embrace the change that we're going through and embrace the times that we're in and say, these are the best times. We're having a shake-up right now. Money is going to move all over the place and redistribute and go into new people's hands. And then there are people who are going to cling to the old way and say, no, 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 I want to keep plowing the field with the donkey. Forget about that tractor. I want to plow the field with the donkey. And they're just going to get absolutely eaten up. Technology unemployment is the elephant in the room that no one's talking about at the moment. Um, you know, when I, when I was in high school all those years ago, um, it wasn't that long ago, come on. Um, <laughs> you can laugh at that joke. You know. uh, the, when I was in high school, the cool kids worked in the CD shop. Well, there is no CD shop. The geeky kids worked in the bookshop. Well, there is no bookshop. And everyone else worked at the checkouts. And there is no checkouts. Right? So technology unemployment is huge. And it's, it's like literally it's just... Like every tech entrepreneur I know sells their technology on the fact that it costs a job. They go, you know, saves a job. Right? They go, oh, this technology wipes out three or four jobs. It's great. Right? So technology unemployment's coming along. We've got to understand that we're either on this wave or we're behind, you know, or we're going to get dumped by this wave. Um, the free economy has sprung up. Every single business is now expected to be giving things away for free. Today we're going to talk about products and the importance of having free products. Personal brand opportunity. Big companies have no idea how to compete with personal brands anymore. They're sitting there going, well, what do we do? We spend billions on all of these logos and designs, and one blogger or one video is like massively outperforming the marketplace. I mean, look at the US government right now. You know, they're, they're pulling, someone somewhere is pulling their hair out about a 29-year-old who's released some videos and some documents on the web, you know, this, this last couple of weeks. So personal brand opportunity, all of these big uh, investments in technology, a lot of them are designed to help you build a personal brand. If you're using it, you'll do really well. If you're not using it, you'll fall behind. Um, people say six degrees of separation around the world. Well, that's rubbish now. It's, within the developed world, it's maybe two or three at most. Right? Isn't it crazy when someone you don't really know friends you on Facebook and you discover you've got 16 friends in common and you had no idea? Right? So these networks are becoming transparent. This means you've got to be thinking like something called a global small business. Three words that shouldn't go together. Global small business. You've got to think like that. We have a sign at our office in London. We've got a big sign on the door 
that says now entering a global small business. Um, there's funding, so, so much funding, if only you know where to look for it. Right? So funding dried up in one place, but it's moved. Technologically, it's moved. Ideas are getting millions for crazy little ideas if you know how to use different ways of funding. There are people, wonderful people all over the world who want to work for your business using something called attendance-based compensation, uh, sorry, results-based compensation. There used to be something called attendance-based compensation, where we'd pay people per hour or per day. Now people are working per job. Um, recently, we, uh, we invested in a little business called uh, Five Squids, and that's people doing little jobs for five pounds. Little job, just five pounds, five pounds, five pounds. So this is results-based compensation. Look at you. She's going, oh, squid. <laughs> Some people think pandas are cute. Some people think, you know, bears, koalas, and you're going, oh, squids, I love squids. Uh, no, I'm just, no, it's the five, I okay. um, There's new infrastructure that allows you to run a global small business, and it's free or it's almost free. There's distribution that allows you to run a global small business, and it's free or it's almost free. Um, what's exciting is that Whenever a technology is introduced, it normally takes 10 to 15 years to fully impact a marketplace. If you go through all of history, uh, radios and aeroplanes and telephones and internets and all of that stuff, they release the technology. It doesn't have a mass market effect for about 15 to 20 years. When you have convergent technology like we have now, lots of different technology bumping into each other, it has a huge effect 10 to 15 years down the track. So this is all really cloud computing kicked off in 2008. Um, social media really kicked off in the early 2000s. So we're looking at literally the beginning right now. We're just at the beginning of a great wave that's transforming. So it's just the start. You're listening to this presentation today at the exact right time in history. There's no real better time in history. Up until this point, all of these technologies were just toys. You know, 20-year-olds in their bedroom building an app and doing that sort of stuff. It's just a toy. But now, for the next 10 years, it's the big deal. So you're listening to this at the exact right time in history. You're at the beginning of something we call the entrepreneur revolution. This is where all the cookies got put into one jar, and suddenly someone's shaken up the jar, smashed it, and there's crumbs everywhere for everyone. Right? So we're going through a big change at the moment. If you want to be ahead of this curve, this is a redistribution of wealth happening right now. Right? It's a very exciting time if you get ahead of the curve, if you're on the wave. There's never been a better time to become a key person of influence. This is the time to become a key person of influence. Um, everything's lined up. This is where you get to move from worker B to key person of influence. This is where you get to get onto that spike. I tell you what, when you get onto the spike, it's, it's crazy scary how fast things move. Do you, does anyone know what the average income is in, uh, in the UK? 30, 25. It's 27,000 in London. It's about 25,000 outside of London. Right? It's not a lot. That's the average income. Right? The, to be in the top 10% is only 60,000. But once you hit that top 10%, it just jumps. It's like, you know, it, it's like jumping in you know, increments of 10, 20, 100,000 as you go half a percentage point in and in and in. So that, that curve goes through the roof once you hit that top 10% of your industry. You go from sort of, you work damn hard to get from 27,000 to 60,000, and then every little advancement after that, it's, you know, 90,000, 150,000, 300,000, and it just. Right? So, this is what we want to talk about today getting on that curve.